So you were saying that when some guys they build up bikes. Yeah. So when uh, you know I've had bikes come in where there's brand new frame, and uh, you know they put in the work stand to build it up, and they've crunched it. You know, and it's just like brand new frame. They're like, you know, six thousand dollar frame. Yeah. Down you there. know, like. So what should what should mechanics and, and, and people be doing in that situation? Well, Where should they clamp it on? Yeah, well, generally, if you can, uh, it's like, do I go on the seat post? Yeah. Um, because if you crush the seat post, you can just replace the seat post instead yeah. of replacing the frame. Yeah. Um, there's, there's a whole bunch of different ways you can clamp it, yeah. but usually the top tube is not a good place to clamp because that's one of the lightest tubes on the bike. Right. So it's the easiest one to damage. Oh, okay. we, we get a lot of damage coming in from, you know, just handling yeah. st stuff, you know, yeah. like roof racks and, um, you know, over tightening uh, seat posts. Yeah. Um, over tightening stems. Yeah. Like, I mean, almost. At one stage, I, I think two out of three forks that came in were crushed from over tightening the stem. Really? You know, like all those forks there yeah. in, the, in the corner. Yeah. Like, they've all got damage on them. Yeah. And, you know, there's so many, you know, just people over tighten, you know, like they don't use a, they don't use a good torque wrench. Yeah. Um, you know, it, one of the things is guys who've been around bikes forever. Yeah. They go, oh, I've been around bikes. I know how to do it, and they just and they they crank it up because they're used to working with heavier stuff. That's right. You know, and yeah. so so a torque wrench is critical. Absolutely. For, yeah. You know, for anyone who owns a carbon bike. Yeah, that's yeah. the thing. It's like, and I mean, I've even got a torque wrench calibrator, so I yeah. can calibrate my torque wrenches. Is that right? To make sure, because you're supposed to calibrate them every now and again. Right? Yeah. So yeah. you need to check that they're reading correctly, so yeah. you can when you torque stuff up, you. It's real. Yeah, right. So I'm, I'm going to buy a torque wrench today. I have to throw a question in for my vlog itself as well and everyone else. He's got the, he had the flu yesterday. <clears throat> I don't give it to me. <laughs> I'll, I'll keep Do my distance. He's already shaken my hand. I've washed it four times. <laughs> I've kissed him at the start. <laughs> Indoor trainers. How many bikes do you see in here that have had trouble or had problems from purely using on indoor trainers and they're static? Um. No, so the only thing that can happen on trainer, and it's not so much a, a thing these days, but um, the corrosion. Yes. You know, that's... The that's, sweat and the bolts yeah. and the tight... Yeah, yeah. Th okay. th that's it. So, um, you know, the, the sort of thing, like you won't get any structural things, but like water bottle inserts, because yes. like the, the sweat will run down your down tube yep. and go straight. And, and it's aluminium on carbon, and, and that's a battery, basically. With an electrolyte, that's a battery because they're opposite ends of their galvanic scale, right, right? So the aluminium was just dissolved because, you know, carbon's really noble, aluminium's really active. And that's why we see you've got, got the handlebars break indoors because people sweat on them and that's right. It's, it's, it, it, yeah, it's, yeah. So you, you hear of handlebars breaking? We do. The, the number one thing we see indoors is people snapping handlebars and they undo the tape and it is an absolute, and that explains it completely. You can see the erosion or corrosion. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it looks like it's something's eaten it with acid, and I guess that, that explains it, absolutely yeah, exactly. what's going and, on. And then you get, you get a combination, it's called stress corrosion, where you've got corrosion and stress, and it exacerbates it even more. Like, and, and so, yeah, I mean, that's a real problem with aluminium aircraft, and that's why like, they're being replaced by carbon aircraft now. Um, so, you know, so you don't have all these service issues, because every time the plane goes up in the sky and it's getting pressurised and you know, it expands and all the loads on it, and then you know, you, you're in a corrosive environment, you know, like airports are often near the coast, and, you know, you get, and, and so corrosion's a massive thing, massive problem for, for, for aircraft, for aluminium aircraft. You know? So that's why you know, the new generation of aircraft, they're going to carbon fibre, you know, A, it's lighter and stronger, but the maintenance aspects are just you know, like on the 787, I think it's um, the, the overhaul, like the, the major service schedules are just way out, like right. compared to, you know, aluminium. The next couple of years. Yeah. These well, guys yeah. are far too intelligent. <laughs> far too intelligent. I'm just overwhelmed with intelligence here. Knowing how many carbon bikes that I've broken over the years, I can tell you honestly, if they make planes out of carbon fiber, I will be walking everywhere <laughs> or catching a boat. No, they've been doing it forever. Oh, no. Uh, I mean, that's what, I used to work at Boeing. Yeah. So, you know, 20 years ago, um, well, 25 years ago, I was working at Boeing. And, you know, we were making rudders for 777, 757. I mean, now the wing on the 787 and a half fuselage is carbon, you know. Really? So, yeah. Um, you know, so, I mean, a rudder on a 777 yeah. that we, we made down at Port Melbourne, um, you know, it's like 40 feet long, 12 foot wide. The whole thing weighs 40 kilos. Yeah, really? 
That's unbelievable. So, yeah. It's the way know, forward, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. But the, the difference in aerospace carbon and and bicycle carbon, yeah. big difference. Yeah, in quality. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and then in processing, you know, it's like, even in the last few years, there's been a big change in the quality improvement on the bikes yeah. as, as the process has become sort of stabilised and, yeah. and people actually understand what they're doing with yeah. it. Yeah, I mean, there's bikes of, you know, even you know, four or five years ago, they'd just fall apart and they'd have yeah. cracks. And, and I mean, you can see all these things visually. And, and I mean, some of the bikes, I mean, some of the things like this, you know, on the top tube, yeah. see that little marbling sort of pattern? Yeah. Well, that's a wrinkle. And that is, you know, and through here, like, they're, they're, these are all wrinkles. Yeah. And they wouldn't fly. Like, yeah. you know, so there was a, a few years ago, they found this tiny little wrinkle in a, in a rib on a, on the 777 rudder. Yeah. And it shut the whole production line and Boeing's share price plummeted. And, you know, all these sorts of things. Yeah. And, you know, in the bike industry, um, it's almost seen as a feature, you know. Oh, look at this cool marbling on the bike. It's, it's not cool. It's you know, it's it, that's a manufacturing flaw. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like, you know, when ghost cracks appear on bikes, yeah, it's usually because of wrinkles. Yeah. And it's like there's been a wrinkle. Um, I've got some micrographs in the office um, on the poster, yeah. which, you know, you can see like the, these wrinkles. Yeah. And it's just like, and if you look at, if you'd imagine it as a tree branch, yeah, you think that would fail. Like yeah. the tree would fall down, yeah. like you know, and that's th these materials. It's 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 like a tree. It's you know, organic shapes work yeah. really well with these materials. Yeah. You know? So having um, you know the squarer sort of more industrial shapes generally have more problems. Yeah. Than more organic sort of shapes. If I was to put a question to you, you had a choice between a steel, titanium, carbon, and aluminium bike. Which one are you going to choose? Carbon. You're going to choose carbon? Yeah, every time. Okay. It's like, I've been building my own carbon bikes. Well, I built my first carbon bike in 92. Yeah. And I've been riding my own carbon bikes ever since. Yeah. So that's my road bike hanging up there. Yeah. And that's my time trial bike hanging up there. Yeah. And I've got mountain bikes and uh, like, so I've always, uh, like, before I rode carbon, I rode steel. Yeah. And I like the, I like the ride of a steel bike. Yeah. Um, don't like the ride of an aluminium bike. Um, titanium? I, I haven't ridden a titanium. I've, I've, I've briefly ridden a, a, a Borm. Um, and that, that was okay, but it's heavier than the carbon. Yeah. You know, and it's, at the end of the day, um, I mean, I, I sort of joke with Darren. I know Darren really well. And we joke, we go, yeah, if titanium was so good, they'd still be making Formula One cars out of it. Yeah, yeah, And yeah. they haven't done that for... 20 odd years. My yeah. mate, uh, one, of, one of my good friends bought a titanium bike and the first, I said exactly the same thing. I said they'd be making, tit like titanium, every bike would be titanium. And so I, I was taking the piss out of it. You had yeah. to be there. But I mean, you know, there's commercial aspects as well. And so, you know, the carbon frames being made in, in China where basically they're all made, yeah. um, it's cost effective. Yeah. So I've always had a question about carbon steerers. You know, so carbon steerers, steerer is the thing that goes up through your, you know, from the fork. That's a steerer. Okay, so, so that's the steerer there, right? So traditionally they were aluminium and now obviously in the last 10, 15 years, they're now carbon. And I've heard of a lot of these carbon steerers breaking, uh, but you know, do they break more than aluminium or steel steerers? So we'll ask Raoul. There are problems, um, often production problems. Um, they are a difficult thing to mould properly. Um, and so we've got these, these examples here where, you know, this, the areas marked in yellow are, um, they're d mould, they're voids technically. So air bubbles have, during the curing process have been trapped in there and, and you've basically got an air bubble between the layers of carbon. Now, air isn't very strong and it doesn't transfer loads very well. So um, it significantly weakens the, uh, the steer on the fork. And so it, it, we, we were finding this, this sort of damage in, in, uh, in a couple of brands sort of quite regularly. And then um, it wasn't that long after the, the brands were doing actually recalls on these forks. What brands? I mean, it was Specialized and, uh, and Giant. Really? They did that, yeah, they had a recall. Um, and that was, you know, they were the ones we were seeing um, a fair bit of, um, yeah. at the, you know, at the time. So, okay. um, but you know, the other thing is, 
people tend to over tighten the stem yeah and and crush 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 the steer and okay. so the, you know the compression plug people think that's just to preload the bearings but that's actually a structural component right in the steerer yeah and um and so it's critical that you use the right compression plug yeah and and it's set at the right height to match where the stem is and so when you see people and they have all these spaces above the stem yeah that you the compression plug then isn't doing its job because it's it's up above the stem so it can't take any of the compressive loads yeah from from the stem clamp you know yeah. so yeah. um yeah okay big problem so are you have i mean you know do you recommend carbon steerers or well, if it's made properly yeah yeah okay um the, the thing is you can't see you can't see this stuff you know so like visually you you won't be able to identify this stuff and yeah. so um you know th that's a problem I, I mean we get a lot of bikes in and the, 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 you know the guys will say oh uh, you know I've, I've i've had a crash um but it's damaged at the back of the bike yeah. and then we'll go through and scan scan the whole bike and do the fork and yeah. find the problem with the, with the steerer right. and it's just like yeah you know so it's like well luckily we found that because that could have been a really nasty accident like yeah. once your steerer lets go yeah. and the front wheel falls out of the bike um when the front wheel and the back wheel separate from the bike it's usually not very good no you know no, it's, the outcome is usually less than favorable yeah, so usually straight on your face that's right you know. Bay, yeah chop that footage right there yeah well even at the worlds a couple of years ago um in the juniors was it was it not last year the years before worlds uh, um are there any are there any brands that are are absolutely rock solid people ask me that all the time and the simple answer is no okay so there are variables across all the brands because they're process variables right so you know sure some brands have less issues than others yeah. you know due to design but you still have these process variables yeah. so it's like baking a cake yeah you can get the same ingredients yeah. but the cake tastes a bit different every time yeah you know and so that's why in aerospace everything gets scanned 100 yeah. percent before it goes in the sky and it's like they've got the process controlled as best as they possibly can yeah and they still have to do this inspection yeah because they know it's critical yeah but in in the bike industry at the moment it's it's just like well we'll just make it we'll have yeah, it looks pretty good yeah. um let's get it out there yeah. and um and as the as the weights of the components have come down yeah. that margin for error is you know it's more critical yeah you know so you, you have less material to to counteract any defects in, in in the structure right so you know you need every bit of material to be doing what it's supposed to be doing mm -hmm. and so by having a, an air bubble in there like a void it's no good it's a problem yeah all right so roll is connecting up a technical looking machine to test the bike and see whether he can fix my frame so this is a, an ultrasound scanner so it's um basically that's a transducer and it sends out an ultrasound high frequency it's um five megahertz on this one uh, five megahertz sound wave that goes through through into the material that you're wanting to inspect and then where there's an interface like um like a void or the back of the material yeah um the sound thing is reflected back right. and then this measures what's reflected back right. so you know if we use like a little sample so that's a piece of carbon laminate known yeah. good laminate yeah aerospace uh, grade laminate um and we put the transducer on it so we, we use a bit of water as a coupling agent and then we put the transducer on it and we look at the screen and we're getting that's the front of the surface yeah and that's the back of the surface and it's showing this is about three millimeters thick which is about right so that's the advantage of Alps and it's it's the, it's the, way, the way to go it's the process so basically what you're saying to me is i could have just taken my bike into the hospital where i work no oh damn it really no so different stuff it's like you know different transducers so you know this is specifically thin carbon laminate is yeah. is the hardest stuff to test okay. right um you know so you need special transducers yeah, to yeah. do that okay so. is there 
they're different types of carbon and is this legitimate marketing? The, is the, it something that buyers should be paying attention to? There are lots of different grades of carbon. Yeah. Um, but in reality, you know, 95% of the bikes are made out of two grades of carbon, which is effectively your T700 grade and your T800 grade. Yeah. Um, there might be very small amounts of higher modulus fibre being used yeah. outside of that, but you, you know, these really high modulus grades are incredibly brittle. Yeah. So, yeah, they're stiffer and, and, and so you can use less to make a lighter bike, yeah. but they're incredibly brittle. So, to give you an example, like your T700 grade will have an elongation of about 2.2 percent, yeah, which is really low. I mean, steel's 13 percent, yeah, right. So, you know, that, that's why steel will bend, and carbon doesn't bend, right. These ultra, you know, these high modulus grades have elongations 0.6.7 percent, yeah. So, you know, they're incredibly stiff and brittle, yeah, and so. You don't actually want to make a bike out of that stuff because it, 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 as, as soon as it gets overloaded, it'll fail. You know, there's no margin. For, it, like it, it, it's even um, your T700. The way it, in an impact, it'll delaminate. Um, it'll absorb energy that way. But you know, the ho the really high grades will just snap. The fiber will snap, and then you know, yeah, you'll have a catastrophic failure basically. Yeah, okay. So. Um, part of that is, is coming down to design, but you know, it's a bit of a joke in that you know, one brand will have, we use you know, ultra high modulus and we, we use super duper ultra high modulus and we use super duper uber, you know, yeah, like, yeah, and yeah. it's just like... It's all marketing it's, chain, it, really. It's, it's spin, yeah. yeah. And so, you know, the other thing about these, these other grades of carbon is they're really expensive. Yeah. And so, you know, your standard grade carbon, like your T700, it's about twenty dollars a kilo. Yeah. Um, I've got, I've got some uh, some really ultra high modulus which I've used on other projects stuff, and it's six hundred dollars a kilo. Yeah, right. So, you know, the, the, the cost of the bikes. Yeah. They're not thirty times more. That's right. You know, so. Yeah. You know, and that's just raw material, and yeah. then the processing of that is has to be more advanced as well. So yeah. um, having said that, I mean, the materials are incredible. Like the high, high modulus, I mean, they're like three times stiffer than steel, yeah. you know, which is absolutely incredible. Yeah. Um, but it's not very practical for bikes. Yeah. You know, so you use your bread and butter stuff. Rel, one question I do have is I want to buy, well, I've got a friend who wants to buy a secondhand carbon fiber bike. Uh, do they fatigue over time? You know, do they deteriorate? Should I never buy a secondhand carbon fibre bike, or are they okay to buy? Well, that's that's a really good question because theoretically it won't fatigue. That's one of the advantages of carbon. That's why it's been used in aerospace. So an aircraft part is guaranteed for 25 years. Yeah. You know, at that service life, which is incredible. So, um, however, if you have these defects in it, like these wrinkles, then you're going to start getting these ghost cracks. You know, if you have bonded sections you can have problems with bonding sections together and that adhesive can break down. You know, if you, you've got the corrosion of being on the trainer, you've got, so you've got all these other aspects. So what I say to people is get it inspected. So, you know, we get a lot of bikes come in where people go, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm selling this bike and I, I want to get it inspected and provide the report to the person who's going to buy it yeah. um, that it's got a clean bill of health, so to speak, yeah, you know, and, yeah. um, or people who have bought bikes and, and they want to check it out before before riding it. Or, yeah, you yeah. Know, and occasionally we have people, who, you know, they bought bikes on eBay and they bring it in to get it scanned and, yeah. um, you know, we find all this, all these dodgy repairs and stuff yeah, on it, you yeah. know. So, you know, people think, like, you can paint over a dodgy repair and nobody's going to know. Yep. Well, we know with this. Yeah. Okay. You know, so we can find all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. So I suppose my next question, I think you guys will agree, is it's the time, you know, like is this a major project or can I just bring the bike in and get you to check it in, in while I wait and have a coffee and, it's a bit and more is it than, cheap? It's a bit more than while you wait. Um, you know, typically with my workload, etc. I, I normally turn around an inspection in a couple of days. Okay. Yeah, so, um, you know, and to do a frame and fork is, um, is typically around $330. Yeah. Um, it needs to be stripped though, just so a bare frame and fork 
um, yeah. to do that to go through the whole thing properly. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you know there can be you know like if it's a complete bike you need to strip it. Yeah. Often that's not a bad thing to do anyway if you're getting a new bike and just going through the components and yeah you know, making you know replacing bearings and stuff anyway and then you're starting from scratch. Yeah. Um, with known good products. Um, but yeah, I mean it's peace of mind. You know, yeah. it's like. You know, how much does a trip to a di to dentist cost when you smash your face? You yeah, know, yeah. Um, you know these sorts of things. And I mean, you wouldn't buy a house without getting a bills yeah. inspection. You wouldn't it, buy a car without getting a bills. It's inspection. a bit like you know buying a uh, a, a rear tail light. People try to save money and spend twenty bucks. The bloody thing's going to save your life. That's right. You know. That's so, right. You know. And you know, there's always going to be people who are looking at the cheaper option. And um, yeah, and that, if they want to take that risk, that's fine. But I wouldn't get in an aircraft that hasn't been scanned. And you know, I wouldn't ride a bike that I'm not comfortable with. You know, it's yeah. like when you're bombing down a hill at 80 plus. Yeah. It's like you're not thinking about how the paint looks. You're thinking, is this bike going to get around this corner? That's right. You know, that's yeah. it's a structural thing that's going to keep you safe, not yeah. not how flashy paintwork is. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So we were just talking about the quality of carbon frames and how they've improved over the years. And uh, Roel was saying that now the quality is way better compared to these days where these are all sort of older frames that he's sort of cut in half. But back in the day, the quality of the carbon and, and the carbon frames was just tears. And people in the car industry forever have said, oh, you know, it, it, you know it's, it's a lemon, you know, like some cars are just not built right, you know, and, and so it's the same thing with bikes, you know. It's, they're all made hand by hand. The frames are laid up by hand individually. So each layer of carbon is placed by hand. And if you put it in the wrong spot, then you're going to have a problem. You know, mm. if if there's um, if there's trapped air or you know if the humidity is not right. You know, like if if it's too humid, you get this moisture going in, in, and then when it goes in the cure, which is at 140 degrees, the moisture turns into steam. And produces gas and produces voids in the part, you know. So, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. You know, so, you know, you need to know this sort of stuff, you know. Like, so you need a, a temperature and humidity controlled environment, you know. And that's that's you know, like we've got the humidity measure up there. We've got the aircon unit, uh, you know, slash heater, so we can control the humidity and keep it within the range that we need to keep it in, you know. Little things like that, which, you know, there's. You know, backyarders, repairers, they just don't know this stuff. You know, yeah. like they've just got no idea. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, like they'll use the wrong, the wrong resin types. You know, they'll use um, even the wrong sandpaper when you're sanding. You can contaminate the surface. So, you know, you need to use the right sandpaper. Otherwise, you're introducing impurities into the, yeah. into the interface when you're repairing it. Things yeah. like that. You know, that's um, unreal, man. It's like. At Boeing, we used to import rags from the United States because they had to be certified rags. And you think, oh, that sounds crazy, but no, it just makes perfect sense because if you're wiping something down to clean it, you want to make sure that you're not putting contaminants down on it. Yeah. So you need to have, you need to make sure that your rags are clean. It's and so, rags, like so, so the ones I use, these are medical wipes. Okay. So, you know, they're sterile medical wipes. Hey, I can help you with that. <laughs> Med shop is good. <laughs> I can get these for you. <laughs> I buy them by the box. <laughs> so that yeah. actually, that you make a good point. So you know, the more layers that you put on the bike, it's actually stronger. It's a, it's better for the bike. Well, not no. That, that's another. That's another. That's another problem. So, um, and that's where people they do a backyard repair, and they think, oh, we'll just slap heaps of material on it. But what you need to know is you need to know the stiffness gradient through the part. So the way the part flexes. So the parts are all designed to flex in a certain way. And if you make the part stiffer or stronger, then th then it'll fail basically right next to that. Yeah, right. And so you, know, you, need, you need a uniform stress distribution through the part. Yeah. And that's why it's critical on a repair to match the layup, match the materials, and, and get it in the same the same totally structural nice, yeah. behavior. So yeah. just putting a bit of like you know everyone thinks you know like the carbon fiber weave you know like the twill weave yeah like that yeah um, that's readily available and think oh it's carbon fiber I can just slap a bit of that down and that's going to solve all my problems and it's like well that's a different weight material it's a different grade fiber it's woven so it's got different properties in the unidirectional yeah. Um, it doesn't bond as well as unidirectional, um, and 
the load, the way the load goes through it, because you've got more resin in it, because the fiber's going up and down because it's woven, you've got more resin, you've got all these other variables. So it's mm. not, the part's going to behave differently. Simple so as that. In layman's terms, be different flex points, I guess. That's right. Yeah. It's going it, to, it's going to have different stiffness, and yeah. so. Um, you know, the, the, like we were talking about before with the, with, with the Kevlar, the stiffest material will take the load first. So if, you, if you're pulling on a steel rod with an elastic band, all the force goes through the steel rod. The elastic band's not taking any load because like, it's, it's, it's not stretching. So the stiffer material takes the load first until that fails. And so if you don't match the stiffness of the material in a repair, then you, you, you're setting yourself up for a failure because the, you know if you make it if you make it too stiff, which you do by putting more material on there, then it's just going to fail there because then well, the load gets concentrated in that spot. Yeah. All right. So just in closing, I'm leaving the bike here with Rel. He's going to fix it up for me. Um, it's it sort of price varies on the damage to the bike. So if you guys bring your bike into a, into here or any carbon repairer, it's going to be based on, on whatever damage. But I'm going to leave it here. And how long until I get it back, do you think? Well, typical, you know, typical repair time is about two, two and a half weeks, yeah. something like that. So okay. um, you know, it does depend a little bit on graphics and stuff with supplies and that. But yeah. that's sort of a typical, All right. typical sort of time. So it's worth it. Yeah. All right, mate. Well, let's fix it up. And worst case scenario, it'll be my Zwift. It'll be my Zwift setup. I'll still ride it though. Raul, no thank you so much, mate. Yeah, that was uh, nice really interesting. I really enjoyed that. Yeah, well, come again if you want. So. I will, man. We'll I, might I might just come and hang out yeah, with you. Yeah, oh, just come and sit in the corner over you there and just the watch. Stories. You wait for the race stories. <laughs> oh, really? When he says Mick, it's not just any Mick down the road, Mick Rogers. Yeah. It's Cadell, what we know, Cadell. Yeah. Many, many stories. Really? Yeah. You've booked an AOS for years. So. Oh, right. Yeah. So you know all the, you know all the crew? Yeah. Did some stuff, the wind tunnel stuff. And... Oh, the wind tunnel. Actually, we'll cover that in mind. The wind tunnel work with Rao. Heaps of fun, but cold, really cold. Oh, yeah, don't do it every winter. No, <laughs> no I, really? I did, yeah. yeah. Oh, it was freezing, but no, nah, good tales. Hey, well, I could have stayed in there for all day. It was so interesting. Raul is so passionate about what he's on about. But what we're going to do, so I hope you guys found that interesting. In the next vlog, it's pretty dark in here, so I'll just quickly, I'll move outside so that you can see. Shane and I. Oh, jeez, that's cold. Oh, it's chilly out here. It's not as chilly as Canada or UK, but it's chilly. So, in the next vlog, uh, we're going to go through carbon wheels, braking with carbon wheels, uh, you know, Taiwanese carbon wheels and Chinese versions, and all these ripoffs. And we'll talk about what's good, what's bad, are they safe, things like that. But that'll be a whole new episode. Uh, probably when I go back to pick my bike up. So if you've got any specific questions about wheels and, and carbon wheels, put the questions in the comments below. Industry here, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. He's got a gold mine there, isn't he? Oh, doesn't he? Well, yeah, we caught that. Just, you know, carbon we bikes, we just nice and light. But oh, very, we just interviewed brittle. him for about an hour. Oh, did you? Yeah. So, he's got a good little business there. Yeah, well, he's, he's got an aer 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 aeronautic background. That's right, yeah. yeah. He's a smart guy. He's definitely a smart guy. Oh, he's a nice bloke too. Yeah, yeah top guy. Yeah.